Good afternoon again, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Beth Stroll with the TA Network for Children's Behavioral Health, and I'd like to welcome you to this month's System of Care Leadership Learning Community Meeting. This session is part of our leadership learning community that's designed to support system of care leaders in all roles in system of care implementation and expansion and sustainability, including those with and without federal grants. Denise Sulzbach and I from the CA Network co-facilitate this learning community, and we try to address topic, topics that are important to you. Uh, we always welcome your suggestions for future topics, so please feel free to send those in to us. This year we're focusing most of our sessions on operationalizing various elements of the system of care approach, which was a need expressed by many of you. And today's session will focus on operationalizing family and youth leadership in systems of care. Uh, we do like these sessions to be as interactive as possible, and so we encourage you to put your questions and your comments or insights in the chat box throughout the session. And we've also incorporated time for question and answer, and Denise and I will make sure that any questions you answer in the chat box are addressed. If you look just below the chat box, you'll see a box that will allow you to download today's PowerPoint presentation and a number of other resources. And as a follow-up, you'll also receive a link to the recording of this webinar. And also at the end of the session, a link will pop up for a very brief evaluation survey. And we would really appreciate it if you would just take a few moments before logging out to complete this and provide us with feedback. We take your feedback very seriously, and we use it to improve our future learning community sessions. I'd also like to let you know about a new learning platform that the TA Network will be launching at the end of January. It will allow you to easily access all of the materials, presentations, recordings, and such on particular topics and will offer you some vehicles for interaction with your peers and to share resources in between our learning community sessions. Uh, more information about this and how it can enhance the learning community experience will avail be available to you soon. We're very excited about the features of this learning platform, and we'll, um, we think it will enhance the experience of our learning communities. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that our next learning community meeting is February 20th, and the focus of that one will be on operationalizing state community partnerships for system of care expansion, which, as you all know, is essential for widespread adoption of the system of care approach across states and also for sustaining systems of care over the long term. Uh, concrete examples and strategies for partnerships will be highlighted, and so we hope you will put this on your calendar and join us then. Again, today's session will focus on family and youth leadership in systems of care. And the objectives are to learn about the requirements and value of family and youth engagement and leadership, roles for youth and families at all levels, how to partner with youth and family-run organizations, and how to use guiding questions as a framework for assessing and implementing youth and family engagement and leadership. And of course, there'll be time for questions and answers following the presentation. We are very fortunate today to have two outstanding presenters who are key members of the TA network. Millie Sweeney is the Deputy Director of FREDLA, which is the Family Run Executive Director of Leadership Association. And she has worked in children's mental health for over 20 years. She has direct experience navigating systems and has worked for system change at policy and system levels, as well as supporting family organizations. And Johanna Bergen. She is the Executive Director of Youth Move National. She has lived experience, and her work focuses on promoting youth engagement and youth voice in policy and systems, as well as supporting youth-driven organizations. Each of them has a prominent role nationally and uh, in the family and youth leadership hubs of the TA network, 
and they bring extensive expertise to this work. So I'd like to thank them in advance for their great work in putting this session together. And now I will turn this over to Johanna, who will get us started. Excellent. Thank you so much, Beth and Denise, for having us um, in your learning community so we can talk about this important topic. And today, we're going to be discussing the requirements and the value that youth and family engagement and leadership in systems of care bring to your work. Um, the following presentation is crafted um, directly from the requirements of federally funded system of care grants and also prioritized to show the true value of youth and family engagement within systems change more broadly. Youth and family Youth and family engagement is of universal value within all of our national social systems. Um, and so we hope you find value both within your current uh, system of care work and also in your systems change work in general. Uh, I would note from the top of our call that our slide deck is pretty dense. Uh, many of the slides are developed as a resource for you, and we would encourage you to download it from the download pod to make use of that. Um, we won't be reading uh, directly word for word everything um, on several of the slides as we hope we, you will use them um, in your own work as a resource. Um, excited to be with you. I'm going to pass over to Millie to talk specifically about the grantee requirements for youth and family engagement. Thanks, Johanna. Um, and welcome, everybody. Um, let's start with what is required in the um, FOA. Um, the SAMHSA cooperative agreements emphasize a number of requirements regarding the importance of family and youth engagement and involvement. Um, the funding requires the integral involvement of families and youth in all phases, from planning to governance, implementation, evaluation, and oversight of grant, grant activities and in the system planning efforts to expand and sustain um, systems of care. It's required that grantees develop and implement specific mechanisms to intentionally promote and sustain youth and family participation, uh, such as peer support, development of youth leadership, mentoring programs, and the partnership between family, adults, consumer, and youth organizations, youth-guided activities, youth peer specialists, um, and it goes on and on. All services in a system of care, and eventually the broader community, must be delivered within a family-driven, youth-guided and directed framework, and that engagement of family and youth is demonstrated through integral partners in their own treatment services and supports. Essentially, families and youth will be fully involved and supported in all planning all implementation and evaluation efforts of the system of care. They'll have significant roles and responsibilities that demonstrate grantee commitment to the project. Additionally, the 2016 and 2017 FOAs add a few more requirements in this area, uh, including coordination with statewide family network grants, lead family contact and task lead for youth engagement positions, and workforce participation through the use of peer support providers, both family and youth, should be expanded. Um, activities should all be consistent with SAMHSA and CMS information bulletins. To really support and ensure family-driven efforts, a lead family contact is a required key position in systems of care. The Lead Family Contact, or LFC, is a critical part of the leadership structure of a system of care and functions as a member of the administration or management team actively participating in strategic planning and budgetary decisions. The role is not a direct service provider position, but one that can guide and oversee development of effective services and service delivery across systems. Hired for their lived experience as the primary caregiver of a child or youth with behavioral needs and in navigating systems for their child, the LFC, in partnership with the Youth Engagement Task Lead, inform the planning, implementation, and evaluation of all system of care efforts. They play a significant role in engaging families and preparing them to participate in advisory and policymaking groups to assist in developing family-driven programming, such as parent peer support, 
They provide training for families and other stakeholders and participate in sustainability activities. To fulfill their responsibilities, the LFC requires resources, including a dedicated budget for the LFC and family leadership tasks or activities, and the support of the project director and colleagues on the management team to strategize around barriers or challenges encountered in their position or tasks. There are several options for hiring an LFC. Uh, contracting with an existing family-run organization is perhaps the most effective approach, as family-run organizations, or FROs, have structures that support and promote the work of those with lived experience, as well as expertise in all aspects of family leadership, support, and family-driven care. A number of states have hired their LFC within the state or local government or contracted with a family member for the position, usually within or through their Department of Behavioral Health. An LFC may also be employed by or embedded within a mental health center or a child serving system, such as education or child welfare. There is a tip sheet on the LFC position for download as part of this presentation. You can see we have a ton of downloads for you. Um, for you to review afterwards and that we'll refer to throughout the presentation. Um, this one includes further information on the roles and the responsibilities as well as a sample job description for the LFC. It's important to recognize, however, that the LFC alone is not sufficient for the development of a family-driven system. When a state signs on to the cooperative agreement to develop a system of care, all partners involved in that funding are accepted responsibility to transform their system to one that is informed, led, and evaluated by families and youth. The LFC can help guide that effort, but it's really the responsibility of all to ensure implementation and change. Johanna? Thank you, Lily. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I'm going <gonna, laughs> um, to um, take a moment to speak specifically to the youth engagement task lead that is required um, in the FOAs, as Millie um, indicated. Much of the um, considerations that Millie reviewed are true as well in youth engagement. Um, so I'll do my best not to reiterate um, the things that Millie said, but instead accent the things that may be unique considerations for the youth task lead. Um, so in the fiscal 16 to 18 funding streams, this um, required task lead for youth engagement is a component um, of the federal grant. Uh, this is a change from some previous cycles where uh, an individual or a specific FTE with a youth coordinator title may have been um, required. Uh, the task lead needs to be an identified um, individual who will take a leadership and strategy role around youth engagement throughout the grantee efforts. Um, but there is quite a bit of leeway on the community's behalf in determining who the best individual for that position would be and what that position might look like. Um, including a, you know, no specific requirement for an FTE equivalent for this position. Um, we've been working with several system of care grantees, and I see, your, see many of you on the phone, um, who have taken various approaches to, to um, identifying this task lead. And what we're seeing um, is that there are, there are multiple strategies to meet this particular grant criteria. Um, and there's also multiple strategies to ensure that the choice um, of strategy you make is successful um, and effective in implementing a, a universal youth engagement strategy. Um, so I'll speak uh, briefly to the, to the um, strategies we're seeing happening across the country. Um, so it is definitely still possible to use your uh, grant funds and resources to hire a full-time youth coordinator at your state, local, or tribal um, leadership entity, and many of you have chosen to do this. Um, this position can work in, um, in tandem with the family lead con contact as well. Um, it is uh, a strategy to hire um, a staff member or to contract for a staff member's time from a community-based organization. 
we see this happening um, in uh, organizations that may be community change organizations, local nonprofits, even service providers. Um, this is sometimes ideal if um, someone can be hired within the specific community your system of care is focused on. Um, and then the youth task lead is a, is a contracted out position. Um, we would still be looking and recommending that the individual be involved in the infrastructure and governance of the system of care grant. Um, we also see communities choosing to contract for a set of services um, more than an individual person's time and effort. Um, and it would be possible for you to contract with a youth-run organization to fulfill the youth enga engagement strategy more broadly. Um, when this happens, uh, the full resources of that youth organization can be leveraged to support a system of care's uh, goal, which um, we see as a value add. Um, you'll still need to, within um, that contract, identify uh, leadership to participate in your system of care governance. Um, and from our perspective at Youth Move and the TA Network, a lead to be identified so that we know who and how to reach out with support and resources and technical assistance. Um, and then we see communities doing a little bit of all of these things, um, having someone in their uh, state or local government being identified as a task lead while also um, putting in a contract uh, with a local youth-run organization to do youth engagement strategies or some other combination. Um, however you choose to go forward with this, um, it's very important to note that the identification of a task lead is not the end of the work. Um, so the identification is the start of the work. Um, and we also have worked with some communities who initially uh, gave the title of youth engagement task lead to someone who also held um, Several, uh, several other job responsibilities um, working across multiple grants or strategies, and the youth engagement work um, was not able to be prioritized on their plate. So we do um, encourage you to think about making sure that your youth task lead is someone who has an, a, an appropriate level of time to dedicate directly to youth engagement strategy. Um, the youth task lead uh, is ideally is not someone who's uh, providing direct service provision, um, even that of youth peer support. Instead, the youth task lead will be someone who is thinking uh, stri strategically and critically about what the youth peer workforce um, in your state uh, may need or benefit from. Um, so there is uh, definitely is appropriate for your youth task lead to be engaged in service delivery uh, types of conversation. Um, but this uh, youth engagement strategy is a more comprehensive infrastructure-based position than direct service. Um, we look for the youth task lead to be fully embedded in your system of care leadership team um, and within your governance structure. We'll be talking a little bit more about that lately. Um, we definitely look for the youth task lead not only to be identified as an individual, um, and, but also to be resourced. Um, and by that, I mean um, your youth engagement strategy uh, will benefit from having its own um, budget within your system of care grant work, and your task lead can be supportive in, um, in implementing a, a strategy for using those resources. Um, the youth task lead will likely need uh, professional development and capacity building opportunities um, as they deepen and develop your youth engagement strategy and that investment of resources in their professional development um, and connecting them to a larger peer group um, is value add to the overall work of the system of care. Um, and then uh, as we're sharing in the chat box, um, both Youth Move and Fredla are available um, to support you in um, anything from job descriptions to strategy development to professional development support um, and coaching around how best to help your um, family and youth leads uh, succeed and ex excel in their roles. Um, and we'll keep getting more specific um, as we move along about um, how we do that. Um, Millie, I think it would be great um, if you could, I'll pass over to you to talk a little bit about the specific ways we can um, support through our learning communities. Mm -hmm. um, as Johanna said, you know, we're 
we're definitely available to, to assist you in this area. But the TA network strives to support you in connecting and empowering uh, the youth and family leads in, in a lot of different ways with a lot of different types of resources. Um, please ensure that you leads and lead family contacts have access to the TA telegram and the TA network website. Links to both of these are on this slide. Um, there are updates, resources, connection to webinars, and other opportunities through the weekly telegram and on the website. Youth Move National and Fredla are also here as part of the, um, the TA network. We're the youth and family hubs um, of the network to offer technical assistance and guidance. Um, one of the things that we do is offer learning communities and affinity groups that are specific to these roles in systems of care. Uh, the learning community for family leaders occurs at least eight times a year, with the next webinar actually happening tomorrow, um, covering a tool that might be useful in organizing your community around quality family support services. Um, also wanted to mention that we have a lead family contact roundtable that's going to be kicking off this month on January 24th um, at 3 o'clock Eastern. Um, there's information on both Learning Community and the LFC Roundtable in the download box um, that's on your screen. Um, Johanna, do you want to talk about the youth? Yeah, definitely. So parallel to this Learning Community and Fedla's Learning Community, we also offer um, a bi-monthly Learning Community for uh, youth task leads, youth coordinators, and others working in your youth engagement uh, uh, strategies. Our next uh, webinar will be February 27th, and we are covering the data that was found in our most recent youth workforce um, survey. And that, I think, will be helpful uh, to understand what the peer group of youth coordinators looks like across the country right now, and we're distilling some of our findings there in a way that will be helpful for your on-the-ground strategies. Um, we also offer, um, in the off month of our webinar series, we offer um, office hours, open office hours, particularly designed for youth coordinators and youth task leads to um, join together for some TA around their work within their grantees. The best way to hear about all of that is definitely the TA telegram. Um, and we'd love to see your name or hear your voice on those calls, um, as well as receive uh, a TA request um, through through um, any of the ways we're uh, posting in the chat box right now. Um, we definitely want to um, remind and reiterate to everyone that your lead family contacts and your youth task leads are truly your partners in creating change. Um, engaging youth and family in multiple ways throughout your system of care work are going to help you with your long-term goals of systems change, increased access to services, sustainability of the framework that you're putting in place. Um, and throughout uh, your efforts within system of care, the resources and investment that you make in building youth and family leadership voice is an investment in, in um, long-term change. We know that um, engaging authentically youth and family and bringing them in um, to our work in such deep ways as we're talking about today requires a shift in thinking um, from traditional approaches within the behavioral health field. Um, we're going to be talking about all levels of system of care operation and how we can truly engage youth and family at every um, single one of these levels. Um, on the slide here is a depiction of a paradigm shift that really needs to occur across all of your partners and stakeholders in system of care work. So entering into the system of care, um, into your system of care effort is really um, a step you're taking to do business differently, and that includes authentically engaging youth and family. Um, this means means that we're asking you and your partners to shift from children must receive services in out-of-home placements to valuing and understanding that children um, are best supported at home with their families, from shifting from a focus on children and youth to a focus on the holistic family, and a shift of creating a culture of 
dependency to creating a culture based on strength and resiliency. Um, this paradigm shift is depicted in the Building Systems of Care, a primer, which many of you may have resource or access. And um, we would really encourage you to discuss this paradigm um, and think about how your work in system of care is shifting this paradigm with your community change partners um, and everyone on your team. And know that um, like we're talking about these shifts today, uh, we're here to help you um, in this work. So we're going to shift a little bit now from the overarching conversation about um, grantee requirements in system of care to thinking more specifically about what does it look like to operationalize youth and family engagement and leadership on all levels. Um, so we're, we'll talk again as sort of in high levels of all the roles um, that are possible and that we would encourage you to be engaging youth and family in. And then we'll um, spend the final part of the webinar um, more topically thinking about areas like your evaluation and your governance. All right, so there are so many roles for youth and young adults and their family members to play. Um, so this is, a, this is a slide that has too many words on it. Um, our apologies. Uh, this is really a valuable resource and a worksheet that may be helpful for you in and of itself. And so I'll briefly describe what we have on this screen. Um, this is a listing of the multitude of ways um, and roles that youth and family can play. Um, anything from um, participating in a, an open house that you may host, from um, becoming hired staff members uh, within your organization. And the roles on this slide are categorized, um, as you can see across the top, the left-hand side of the screen is showing um, roles for youth and family to inform you, to share input into your process, moving to the next column of consultation, to involvement. Um, as you move to the right-hand side of the screen, they are roles where youth and family can truly collaborate with you, and then into true empowerment roles. As you're um, engaging a youth and family strategy throughout system of care, we would encourage you to find yourself creating roles and opportunities for youth and family engagement across all of these columns. Um, there definitely is, in system of care, true places to collaborate and empower with youth and family. It doesn't mean you don't do the other things. Um, as you, um, depending on the project or the part of the initiative that's in front of you, there will be um, fitting roles. Some of the things like focus groups may be one-time events or events that you return to in a quality improvement process, while your steering committee may be a constant where you have youth and family on your steering committee throughout the life of your system of care. The thing to, to keep in mind as you build these roles and engage youth and family um, are the key uh, considerations in the blue arrow across the bottom of this diagram. Um, throughout all of these roles, we want to be working to build safety, transparency and trust, true empowerment, choice, collaboration, mutuality, culturally responsive approaches, and peer support. And as you might see as you move further to the right of these when you're truly in collaboration and empowerment roles, um, youth and family will feel um, more empowered, will have a greater sense of trust and safety, and have a larger um, association with peer support. So these are the considerations that we want you to keep in mind as you're creating the opportunities within your initiative to engage youth and family. Um, another way to think about this in terms of what are the roles for youth and family are um, what specifically might youth and family be um, advising on or working on. Um, the following two slides are broken into two sections. So this slide is thinking about roles for youth and family at um, our system level. So either um, whatever your, um, count, your governance level is at or your policy making um, level is at. Um, and then on the next slide, we'll talk about roles um, sort of at the child and family support level. So youth and family have um, amazing uh, skills 
at delivering messages, building awareness, and creating um, change, especially if you think back to that paradigm shift. Um, it's incredibly powerful for youth and family leaders in your community to become your trainers, your ambassadors, your educators in the work, um, and really solidifying practices like always presenting information about the system of care and presenting training um, to your workforce with youth and family co-presenters um, is an uh, important practice of system of care. Uh, youth and family um, can be incredibly valued contributors when we're developing evaluation of our policies and services. Um, oftentimes, it is, um, it is those of us with lived experience who can point to the outcomes um, of, that are most important to us and to center evaluation around um, outcomes that are um, going to be important and sustainable in your community. Um, and of course, we're seeing an emergence of the parent peer support workforce and the youth peer support workforce across this country. And there are um, valuable roles for youth and family to play in developing training materials, offering that training, developing components uh, for certification for peer roles, et cetera. So I'm not going to go through every single bullet on this slide because we have so many ex rich examples coming later in the presentation. Um, Millie, I'll pass it off to you for a comment about um, family engagement at this policy and systems level, and then mm -hmm. um, talk more about the child and family level. Sure. Um, I wanted to mention that um, families um, and youth can, can play really rich roles within CQI processes. Um, as Johanna had mentioned, um, when you're evaluating particularly service delivery, because they've been there and done that, um, but also strategic communications. Um, they know where families and youth are. They know the language to use, the approach to take, um, what would capture their attention, what wouldn't. Um, culturally, um, what fits um, when you're talking about mental health. Um, if you involve them in your strategic communications, whether it is your outreach um, or your materials, um, or if you are developing videos, and, and we'll look at some other um, examples in this area a little bit later on, um, but I've found that um, in that area, they're, they're such a great resource. Johanna, do you want to move on to the child and family level? Yes, definitely. Um, so similarly to, this, to the, this concept of youth engagement and family engagement being necessary at each of the levels, um, there is definitely a multitude of opportunities for youth and family to be involved within sort of the child, youth, and family um, level. So this might definitely be through the provision of peer support. Um, and we have resources for you if you're thinking or actively offering peer support in your community. Um, but there are also many other roles that we know um, that youth and family are particularly effective at. Um, I think the one that I would point out most specifically is that um, youth and family members who have navigated the system previously and experienced the process of accessing services and identifying where and what is available to you in the community have this really great resource um, in that experience. And so if they are offered a very specific way to share that expertise with other um, families as they are navigating it, um, the, the informal peerness in that relationship can make the navigation process more seamless um, and also uh, help families feel more supported in that process. So um, that navigation process might look like having um, family member staff, a hotline in your community, being available via phone for families who are looking um, for the service options that are available. Um, that might look like contracting with a youth or family organization to be that navigation hub or that place where you can um, ask any question and know there's a 411 book behind the desk with all the answers. Um, and so I think there's we, we want to make sure that we truly value the, the expertise the journey offers um, to our youth and family partners and think about how they can uh, best share and leverage that back. Um, 
And then uh, I think another role that we see really common is that idea of support. Um, and so somehow offering formalized support group environments, um, peer connection um, for a young person to really be able to say, I've been there, I've experienced that, I have empathy in this moment, um, and, and there's a future path. Um, and being there um, in support in the moment. So there are so many ways um, that our youth and family partners within system of care can be of immediate uh, benefit and support to um, families that are currently navigating our behavioral health system. One of the things to consider as a role um, for youth or family is at the information referral and intake point. Um, it's, it can be difficult when you're going through an intake process, if, if you've ever done that, um, and dealing with um, all the questions that are being asked and that sort of thing. If you have uh, a family member um, or a peer that's with you going through that process, whether they are gathering information, they're introducing you to um, what your options are for services and supports, uh, it makes a world of difference in your comfort level um, in in entering services, in knowing what your rights and responsibilities are, um, and, and just knowing that there are other people who have gone through this. Um, it, it's very helpful to have them be um, the first face uh, that a, a family or another youth sees as they begin to enter services, and they introduce them um, to the other partners and service providers that, that might be helpful to them. There's a lot of benefits to working with family and youth-run organizations. Um, and really, it's, it's really the most effective way to engage youth and families at all levels in your system of care is to contract and partner um, with your local or your state youth and family-run organizations. They're structured for and have tons of experience in this realm, as well as being connected to established networks of families and youth in the community and across the state. Family and youth-run organizations can do a number of things. They can represent, engage, and involve uh, many youth and families um, across different types of communities and populations and cultures. Um, they fulfill roles at both the system and policy level in their states and communities already that you can leverage, um, as well as engage them in new roles. Um, they provide perspectives from people with lived experience that can improve services and systems. Um, they're also very valuable in your efforts to recruit, train, mentor, and support family members um, and youth who are ready to move into policy and system level participation. Um, a lot of them offer specific training for that. Family and youth-run organizations can also fulfill roles at the child and youth and, and family level, such as peer support services, as we just talked about. Um, they can be involved and are very good at training, uh, mentoring, supporting family members and youth who have moved into a professional role at the service delivery level. Um, as well as helping families and youth understand how to navigate those systems. Um, they provide training to all sorts of stakeholders, not just families and youth, but also other professionals um, and other system partners. Um, one of the ways that, that you can really partner with them is as you're doing trainings and as you're doing outreach in your community and with stakeholders is to always have a youth and family member as a youth and a family member as a co-presenter with you to model what system of care and collaboration really means. Um, they also can lead and participate in social marketing and strategic communication efforts, um, as we talked about earlier, and we're going to have some uh, specific examples coming up here soon. So let's talk about strategies. Um, the next three slides reflect specific strategies for partnership work with family-run organizations and youth-run organizations. Um, in your system of care work, you can educate others on the benefits of working with these organizations to build and operationalize family and youth voice and leadership, as well as impact policy that would support such partnerships by others. Um, if you expand your services array, by building capacity within the youth and family movements and the peer support and systems work they offer um, is another effective strategy. 
you can establish formal partnerships with family and youth-run organizations, um, that's a very effective way to accomplish these types of things and to infuse youth and family-driven effort throughout your system of care. Using mechanisms such as contracts that have very specific scopes of work that fit within their expertise, and MOUs that outline contributions and responsibilities for all partners are pretty effective. It's also critical to provide appropriate resources to accomplish the work that needs to be done. This applies to funding, materials, and time necessary to build family and youth programs and organizations. Plan now through building a data infrastructure to collect both quantitative and qualitative data on family and youth involvement, activities, and outcomes. Identify how you can use this data along with youth and family voice to sustain family-run organizations and youth-run organizations beyond the federal grant. It's often been said it's not what happens during the grant funding period, it's what happens afterwards um, that proves the success of your system of care. Develop and implement CQI processes that support and promote the growth and maintenance of this work. Actively incubate emerging youth and family-run organizations in your system of care through financial support and technical assistance around organizational development and operations. Johanna? And I would just add, really, um, the importance of developing those partnerships um, and those that work in MOUs and contracts. It's valuable to the sustainability both of the family and youth-run organizations as well as to the, to the value you place in the moment of that work um, in the long term. That documentation um, in many communities has been key to sustainability. Um, we also know that you may be working in a community that does not have um, a current engaged youth or family-run organizations, and there are many examples um, and peer learning you can um, experience within the system of care network of grant resources helping just such an organization be developed. Um, so you may be at a different um, stage in this particular type of partnership. Mm -hmm. Johanna, if I could say one more thing about that. As you are developing or considering developing a family or a youth-run organization, recognize the time and the effort that goes into that and, and think about that early because it is a process to work up to. And there's a number of steps involved in um, you know, identifying what um, that organization would do, um, how they can be of benefit to the community, um, sustaining options for funding. Um, there's a lot that goes into that, that um, a system of care is perfect um, for helping incubate and, and develop and support that process. Definitely. Awesome. So I'll speak briefly to another strategy. Um, this is work that has grown out of our very real experience in system of care communities, um, and that is the role of assessment. And so um, we'll speak briefly about a couple of tools that are available for you. Um, the first is the Youth and Young Adult uh, Voice Assessment, um, the YVAL and the YVOC. These are two assessment tools that have been developed in partnership with Portland State uh, RTC in Portland, Oregon, and Youth Move National. And they can be used in, in many ways, um, but I would encourage you to think about how they might be used in your system of care work to establish where you are um, on a baseline of youth engagement um, and use that knowledge of where you are um, across a set of domains to be planful about how you want to grow and develop. Um, so the YVAL and the YVOC are two separate tools. The YVAL looks at the, um, the youth engagement that an, a single agency or organization is participating in. So you may have direct service providers, you may have um, specific uh, uh, youth organizations or family organizations in your community that would participate in something like a YVAL, it's a 360, um, it's a 360 review, so young people fill it out as well as everyone else in the agency. Um, the YVAL measures on all eight domains that are here. So for example, um, in the collaborative approach, um, there are questions about are young people treated as valued partners in the decision-making process? 
so everyone will contribute their answers and responses to that. And then the assessment is returned to you in the aggregate, so you can look at across these eight domains, um, where are we really strong at? Um, maybe our young people and our um, adult allies feel very empowered um, to include young people in all of their spaces, and the young people, when they're included, feel empowered uh, to share their voice. Uh, but perhaps um, we are lower in the domain or less um, experienced in the domain of vision and commitment, where we're really looking at if youth are involved as decision makers. Um, and then we can take some very specific steps to move forward um, in the, the vision and commitment domain. Um, the color coding on the slide shows you the difference between the YVAL and the YVOC. The YVOC is an assessment that looks at youth voice and engagement in collaborative spaces, which is perfect oftentimes for our system of care governance structures that are made up of several um, different partners. Maybe you have 13 partner organizations coming together around your governance table, um, and you're hoping to be authentically engaging young people at that table. So why VOC will look at the top four domains, the domains in black, that are most appropriate for that cross-agency collaborative table. Um, there are more details on YouthMove's website if you guys are interested. We think these are great training and technical assistance tools, um, as well as uh, CQI tools for you guys to think about um, with your youth uh, engagement and system of care. Similarly, um, there is going to be a tool that will be available for um, Family Voice, um, the FamVote or Voices on Committees um, was developed last year, and it's going to be piloted this year. Um, it's intended to gauge the extent to which councils, committees, and advisory boards support family voice by engaging and supporting family members to be active and influential members. It's used to measure the current level of support for family voice within a group and provides an opportunity for learning and growth. Um, it assesses support for family vo voice along four themes, um, overall vision and commitment, collaborative approach, empowered representation, and support of family members' participation. Um, information on the FAMVOC is available in the download pod. If you're interested in being part of the validation process in the coming year, please let us know. Um, we're going to be doing a pilot with Georgia uh, through Sue Smith. Um, in January. Once that's done, we'll be at a place to validate the tool, and we'll need probably 20 to 25 councils or committees to participate in order to do so. If you're interested, um, contact Melissa Pearson with FREDLA, um, and I will put that in the chat box, um, her contact information. I think it's also on the bottom of the FAMVOC um, one-pager. So um, looking at time, we probably need to start speeding up a little bit here. Um, so to support the inclusion of youth and family across all the moving parts of system of care cooperative agreements, um, there was a, uh, a need for some guiding questions. Um, we developed guiding questions um, according to uh, the FOA and the federal grantee site visit requirements, which are listed on the slide. Um, the list of guiding questions was created by youth and family leaders applying best practice to grantee requirements. We're going to highlight some of these questions, but the full document is available in the download pod. We really encourage you to consider and use these guiding questions as a framework for your youth and family engagement in your system of care. Some of the ways we suggest that you use it um, are guidance for leadership and government, governance committees for implementation of system of care principles and values. It can be used as a checklist to describe your efforts, challenges, and accomplishments in youth and family-driven care, um, engagement, and leadership. It can also be used as a framework for internal planning and improvement processes and as part of your CQI efforts. Whatever you do, um, we strongly encourage you to be strategic in your approach in all areas of your system of care development and implementation. So as you consider these guiding questions that we're going to go through, um, be sure to incorporate the following steps for every strategy you employ. Uh, plan, do, study, act. Um, you've probably heard this before. Uh, plan what you'll do, do it, 
and then study what worked and didn't work, and then act to make changes based on what you learn. Repeat, repeat. Um, so we'll start with guiding questions in the strategic planning area. It's the first section um, that you'll see for youth and family engagement. Um, on the screen are some of the questions that, that are involved there, um, like what's structural, which is leadership, or organizational, partnership, service delivery, policy, et cetera, roles do family and youth play? Um, that's one of the things that, that you can ask yourselves and um, do a, a check off um, and strategize around. Um, what plans do you have to sustain their roles and engagement? Again, the, the full download um, is available of these. I'm looking at the times so I'm going to go through um, the questions kind of quickly because you have those. Um, taking a deeper dive, um, there's lots of examples um, of this process in our technical assistance experience, and it really bears out in the evaluation data as well. Um, it's a very, very important to have youth and family engagement from day one. Um, we strongly recommend, based on the lessons learned and best practices, to practice this process from day one. Youth and family need to be at the table from the very start. Um, they need to be there gathering information about needs and gaps in services, what do families, youth, and other stakeholders say and want and identifies gaps. Um, to uh, be there to identify the fit for youth and family voice in each area. Um, and specific methods that are effective for recruiting, training, and retaining um, family and youth. Um, you need to plan and budget for all associated activities and tasks um, for, for the LFC and the youth lead, um, as well as um, if there's going to be a youth or family program or an organization that's developed, um, you need to plan now for that and budget for it. So one example that we'll share with you is the concept of creating uh, interlocking logic models between your overarching system of care framework and your youth engagement and family engagement. So um, we have just one example here. This is a de-identified logic model for a youth engagement strategy from um, a fellow system of care grantee. Um, I say just one example because we've done a learning community series on this type of logic model development before that if you're interested in, we'd love to refer you to. Um, but this is an example of a grantee community who did a youth-focused, um, youth co-led uh, logic model creation process starting with focus groups with um, young people in their catchment area about what they needed in their community and what was missing. Um, and then that process led to the development of this logic model. Um, the strategies, for example, the opportunities for statewide youth connections was rolled up into a system of care uh, strategy. So there was a commitment to invest um, time and resources into creating opportunities like that. Um, and so we would recommend that not only are youth and family in involved in planning from day one, but that you also document very clearly in your plans um, your approaches and how you're going to research those approaches uh, for youth and family engagement. You happen to be on a phone call where several of us like logic models, so that's the format we're showing for you today. <laughs> um, but there are many Just ways. Just know that not everybody that. likes logic models. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I'm going to roll us from this planning concept into an area around governance. Um, so again, there are a handful of thought-provoking questions that we offer for you to consider about your governance structure and how it may or may not be reflecting authentic youth and family engagement. Um, so uh, an example of a question being, does your current government stru governance structure give youth and families authority in the decision-making process? Or is their participation limited to an advisory role? So in empowered engagement, youth and family would have a vote if anyone else on a committee also had a vote. Um, and so we want to make sure that decision making is uh, is offered equally across youth and family uh, leadership roles. Um, 
So again, those guiding questions are there for you to be helpful, and I'll talk more specifically about some examples of governance structures. So how you set up your system of care governance is a reflection of, the, of what you value. So um, how you choose to give voice and choice to youth and family within your system of care governance structure is one of the clearest ways to place value on, to show the value you place on their expertise and guidance. There are several options available for you and system of care governance structures look very different and are tailored appropriately to your communities. Um, there are many ways to engage youth and family in this structure and have it be effective. Um, what we want to encourage you today is to either look at your current structure critically, um, or if you're in a development phase, uh, think about these questions as you develop, um, is how can you create a structure that embeds a authentic representation of youth and family who match the experiences um, and culture of the youth and family you're serving in your community, um, and how is that representation a felt in a top-down way, as well as sort of a parallel side-to-side -side way. So these levels we're talking about, we want to make sure that voice and choice from youth and family um, is heard in each of those levels. Um, an example that we see on some uh, system of care communities, this is true in the states of Washington and Pennsylvania, for example, use a governance structure um, around a tri-lead or a tri-chair concept. This is an example where um, instead of having a lead of your governance structure or a co-lead, you have three people in equal decision-making and facilitation roles, one being a youth representative, one being a family representative, and the third being another type of system partner, perhaps a policy-making or governing position, perhaps a provider position. Um, and the three, uh, the three differing viewpoints there are then used as the leadership vehicle of that structure. Um, I'll share in a moment um, an example of some, um, some detail about how Washington structures that um, in, in their system of care. Um, another example was shared um, more recently by South Carolina, and a quick visual on the screen here. Um, you'll see family and youth representation highlighted in bold. And you see that they've chosen to very carefully place youth and family representatives on each of their teams. So this governance and the systems management, it's not that youth and family are just on the leadership team, they're represented on the other teams as well. Um, and that if this is of interest to you, if you're actively trying to improve uh, youth and family engagement on your governance structure, um, there was a learning community uh, done last um, summer, and the recording link will be made available to you um, that might help you uh, follow more um, closely South Carolina's examples as well as um, several other system of care examples. So service delivery is a great place um, to, to consider how families and youth can be involved because they're a rich source of, of information and guidance for you. Um, things to consider are um, how are they engaged in choosing the services and supports that are going to be um, available through your system of care? Um, do you ask them, you know, what, what's working, what's not working? Um, let them inform and guide you as to what might be missing or where to really focus on improving um, or building up supports that would be available and, and dealing perhaps with access issues. Um, on the flip side of that, make sure you come back around um, and ask families how our system, how our um, services and supports going. Um, being part of a CQI process for service delivery can really make um, things flow more easily in your system of care. When they provide that feedback, um, use it. Um, and make sure that you have a feedback loop um, for families and for youth as to what you did with that information. Um, it's very helpful to have families um, who are involved in evaluating um, services, interpreting um, what your evaluation data 
shows and how it can be used. Um, they're great sources of information because they, they live it and they are consumers of the process. Um, embedding family and youth leaders at the state level can really help with this um, because they can assist in the development of certification processes. Um, they can help standardize training statewide for parent peer support. Um, this is being done in several states, and I've noticed that in the, the chat box as people were introducing themselves, we have a number of people um, who are family leaders who are embedded um, at the state or county level. Um, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, New Mexico, Oregon, and Oklahoma are examples of this. Um, for example, Oklahoma, there's a family lead that's involved in the development of policy and practice at the state level. Um, she supports development of county level system of care, helping them uh, and guiding them in the implementation and strategies and then evaluating um, how that's going. Um, she also provides TA to both counties and family-run organizations to ensure that there is a, a, a family voice um, that's there. Um, so that, that is one strategy that we find um, happening um, in several different states. Um, also, youth and family can, can lead services as being service providers. Um, as Johanna mentioned, um, we're seeing a great growth in the youth and parent peer support workforce. Um, what we are hoping to see more of, and there seems to be a, more of a need, is, is peer supervision for this workforce, to have support for them, um, to help them maintain their role, and help them navigate um, uh, the challenges that, that may arise when you are using your personal lived experience in a very professional way. Um, Peer supervision can also be contracted uh, through family-run organizations. That's something that we see happening. Um, and we also see that youth and parent peer support providers um, can work together well in families, but that's also an area of challenge um, that it's good to get some TA around um, so that they can see how they work together as a team with both the family and the youth within the same home. Johanna, you want to speak on um, informing development and implementation? Sure, definitely. So I think we're all very excited about peer support, as we should <laughs> be. Um, there are also many other ways that youth and family um, should be leaned in upon in your uh, development of your service array. Um, so I think about this in a couple of ways. Um, one is in a CQI loop, which we'll talk about shortly, in terms of are the services we're offering effective? Um, what are we missing? What are those holes? How might we fill them? Um, youth and family in your community are going to have um, that North Star answer for you in those difficult conversations. Um, but also, oftentimes, a system of care uh, grant in your community or even a systems of care approach um, in your work if you're not a federally funded site involves the opportunity to infuse something new into your service array, um, to bring a new type of training or a new type of service to, um, to your array. And there have been effective um, practices uh, led to have youth and family be a part of decision making in, in selecting those services. So if you're interested in building um, trauma-informed care practices in your community, for example, there are several um, uh, there are several pieces of curricula, there are several pieces of training, and there are several promising practices that you might be choosing from to train your workforce in. Um, it would be possible to offer through focus groups, through surveys, through advisement with your youth and family leads, um, to have youth and family prioritize the components of each of those options and to make a selection for best fit for your community based on the criteria that are prioritized by your youth and family. Um, and so we'd really encourage you to think about how are you, how are you making your service array decisions while being um, guided and uh, advised by youth and family um, leads. This is a good sort of segue into um, our next section, which is a set of questions about evaluation and CQI, or continuous quality improvement. Um, and we're really curious and want you to dig into how are youth and family engaged in your local evaluation plan, your data collection, and your analysis of the data. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, young people and their family members are often ideal um, to be engaged in outreach for efforts, including participation in evaluation. Um, several communities use peer evaluators um, for youth and family to be able to have their data collected um, by someone who they identify as peer. Um, it's important uh, definitely to think about evaluating the effectiveness of your system of care and are you moving the needle on the outcomes that matter to you most. Uh, we want to make sure that your outcomes um, that you're striving for have been defined by youth and family um, as, as well. Um, and then it's also important to think about how youth and family are a part of your continuous quality improvement measures, again, at all of those levels, in direct service, um, all the way up to your governance and management and leadership structure. Um, in light of changes many of you have um, received in participating in a national evaluation of systems of care, um, you still have local evaluation um, efforts going on, which can be a great strength to sustainability um, of your system of care work. Um, we're available to help you think about um, your evaluation and CQI efforts um, and to assist you in how to critically um, think about involving youth and family more deeply in these areas. Um, and again, I would refer back to that paradigm shift that we started at the very beginning that system of care requires us to participate in. And I think uh, particularly in our approach to evaluation and outcome identification, this is one of the places where we might feel most pushed um, as we bring empowered uh, youth and family members into our work. And maybe that means it uh, shows how important it is. Um, so there are several ways um, that uh, families and youth can be involved in evaluation. Nellie? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, there's actually going to be a tip sheet uh, coming out. It's in review right now about family involvement and engagement at all the different levels of evaluation and assessment. But some of the things that we see happening um, are having like family advisory groups that are specific to evaluation in the system of care site. Uh, they help identify what should be evaluated. Um, they can review and assist in, in the results and in interpreting what that means to them uh, from a family perspective or from a youth perspective. Um, also, they can help develop the best ways to disseminate that information and use it. Um, in some cases, uh, youth and family are hired directly as evaluators. Um, and what you may see is improved retention and evaluation um, because, again, they have that instant rapport um, with youth and families. And, and so they know where to find them. Um, they're more engaged with them. Um, it also improves the quality of the data collected um, because they do have that rapport and there, there's a trust there um, that, that's natural when it's a peer-to-peer -peer, um, type relationship. Um, the next section that um, is involved in the, the guiding questions that we are suggesting as a framework um, is around communication, communications, messaging, and partnerships. And we've mentioned this before. Um, some of the things you might want to consider is how are youth and families involved in developing the strategies and the methods, the methods that you use for outreach um, and engaging people within your system of care. Um, everything from deciding what your promotional items are um, that families and, and youth might want to use um, and, and that would get their attention um, to the, the layout of um, a brochure or the types of materials that, that families um, and youth would, would like to see and use. Um, you should ask, how are you using and involving youth and families in state and local relationship building. Um, hearing and seeing someone um, put, put a face onto um, what is going on uh, in the community can make a huge difference um, whenever you're building relationships and making the case for uh, better collaboration or improved services or improved access. We want to give you a couple of examples here. Um, of the ways in which youth and families have been involved in strategic communications and messaging. Um, we're going to start with um, the Youth Forward video. Um, I want to point out to the, this that youth identified the topics 
for this video. They wanted to have their parents involved, and so they pulled them in, and together they developed the video from the images to the messaging and even the music used. Um, so Tiara is going to play that for us just like any other for just about a minute. Mental health is real. Before we play the video, I do want to Mental health is a process. Audio Mental health is treating, treating your mind the same so way you would treat your body audio with respect and care. You just want to go ahead and sit down your telephone. You don't have to hang up. You're crazy. Just sit down your telephone and your you phone. are insane. So again, you want to sit down our telephone. Mental health is not someone trying to act out or get attention. Es algo que no debe ser ignorado en realidad. Mental illness is not all of you. Mental health is shattering the stigma. We all know that there's people out there that need help. There's people that your mom, your dad. So finding ways to support them and letting people know that it's out there. So let's deal with it together. When I was very young, I'd get into fights. I'd get in trouble in school. I was always having like these emotional outbursts. Porque en realidad, Él tenía un problema que yo vine descubriendo poco a poco por el comportamiento. Imagine your mind sort of like a crazy speedway and you have 20 lanes going in different directions. That's sort of like what my mind is like. Just cut this so that was one example of a video that was just developed um, to to really message and promote a mental health awareness message in a community. Um, the whole video is about. Yeah. How, how does it make you feel? How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? We're gonna watch um, one other short video. Um, this one was developed by youth and young adults here in um, Miami Dade County. Um, Why are you so angry? I think the power of what can I come know. from I don't like young your attitude. people being asked, What you mean? There um, it is. What's not working? And, uh, Why do you talk like that? Why are you dressing like that? Why does your face look like that? Why do you have this rude girl mentality? Good morning. Are you sad? Okay, look at these cats. They'll make you happy. I don't care. Cats. Don't you like cats? No. Cats. Oh. How do you feel about these cats? Aren't they warm and fuzzy? Oh. Don't you love cats? Yeah. Cats. Pretty. They're, they're gorgeous. Your mom told me that you stole her earrings. No, I didn't. She misplaced them. You know, it's okay to tell me the truth. Good morning. Good morning. How are you feeling today? I feel kind of sad. Whoa, it's sad? That's not normal. You know what? Nothing to worry about. I'm going to prescribe you 600 milligrams of antidepressants. Isn't that a bit much? Okay. Do you need it only? Yes. Well, that's new. Where'd you get it? How are you? I'm fine. So, are you ready to begin? Yeah. Okay. I have this method that I would like to try with you. Look at these cats and tell me how you feel. Well, you know, I'm not on anyone's side. You know, I just want to know what happened. Oh, well, I'm here to help. Don't worry. Okay, thank you.
Okay. Awesome. I, just, I want to run. Oh, I just want to give a couple instructions um, and remind folks to go ahead and mute their computer speakers again and pick back up your telephones. You just want to mute your computer speakers again and pick back up your telephones. Thank you so much, Tiara. So um, again, this last video that we saw is something that was really developed out of a very open discussion space that came from young people being asked what's working and not working for you. Um, there is, as you can uh, might have heard, a provocative nature to this video that was very authentic to um, the, the purpose and the message that the young people wanted to get across in Miami. Um, this video has sparked several different types of reactions from communities and been widely shared um, amongst the Youth Move Network and System of Care. I think one of the most um, exciting things is that the, the topics in this video sparked um, the understanding that there was a need for young people and providers to be hearing from each other's perspective. Um, and Youth Move members did go on to uh, use the video as the starting of discussions and trainings with service providers on youth engagement strategies. Um, and so uh, engaging youth and family um, in your creation of your messaging and promotion um, can be incredibly powerful. That's the last section that we were um, going to address with you. I wanted to leave you um, with the reminder that sustainability really starts um, now, sustainability of system of care and sustainability of youth and family engagement. It's your work today. It will be your work tomorrow. Um, and in order to support that, we encourage you to build clarity around your engagement strategy, build capacity among your youth and family leaders, and build a culture of expectation of engaging youth and family in everything that you do. Um, Beth, I'll turn it over to you for some Q&A. Actually, this is Denise, and I'm going to save Beth's voice for just a few minutes. Uh, Johanna, the first question is for you. Stephanie was interested in states with youth peer support. We did provide a list of states that either have or will soon have Medicaid reimbursable peer support, but can you talk about some of the other funding mechanisms which, that you see across the country? Yeah, definitely. So in addition to the list that was shared in the chat box, Stephanie, we've probably worked with another dozen to 16 states who are offering some form of youth peer support but to a smaller population or geographic location. So peer support might be available to um, young people within the child welfare system only, or young people um, in a particular town may be receiving peer support that is funded through a grant or a foundation mechanism. It's a little harder for us to track all of the, the nuances of that. Um, I'll drop a link in just a moment to Youth Move National's peer support ref, uh, resources, many of which include examples from different states. Um, it can be helpful to, um, to sort of find a, a similar state or a peer state um, that would be a good learning opportunity for you. And then um, other learning communities have definitely approached uh, peer support topics, and so we're happy to follow up spe with specific resources um, as well. I right. want to add um, that there is there's potential funding uh, for peer support and for all of our system care activities um, in, in so many different ways and in all the different child serving systems. Um, TR just added to the download box potential funding sources um, because the peer support, family, parent peer support has been funded through child welfare dollars, um, education dollars, um, juvenile justice dollars. Um, so there's lots of different ways beyond Medicaid um, in which you can fund those services. Thank you, Melly. And before we move off of peer support, Crystal uh, from Pennsylvania typed in the box, really recognizing the need for specific um, CPS and peer support for transition age youth. And I know that's a topic that's near and dear to both of your hearts, and we will be <laughs> launching a learning community on this topic or relaunching. Um, do either of you have any comments on that before I have one more question for Millie? Sure. I mean, Crystal, I think the work Needed. that's happened in Pennsylvania <laughs> is a great example, right, um, of the importance of this. So if you are working with a population of young adults who are transitioning, by which we mean um, currently receiving services in the children's mental health system and may need to access services in the adult system or may be able to transition to sort of a resiliency journey without services, the peer role, the youth peer role in that space 
is unique in that the um, peer needs to understand and be able to navigate resources on both sides of that transition. Um, and oftentimes that, that uh, increases the need for very specific and tailored uh, training. There's also an, a cultural approach to working with young adults of this particular age that a unique training in this way can address. Great, thank you. Nellie, did you want to add? Uh, no, I think, I think we covered it. I think it's important um, that we have um, some type of peer support that bridges um, between the child serving system and the adult uh, system um, because it is, there's a huge gap there that people fall into. Um, going from one to the other, all of a sudden you're supposed to be an adult. As, as a parent of a new adult, um, you know, the expectation for her to navigate everything now on her own is just automatic. Um, when she's always had someone supporting her. All right, thank you. So, Millie, we had another question from Laura, and she was wondering whether or not parent advocate training is different than peer support training. Can you comment on that, please? Yes, um, it is different um, because they do different things. Um, while they're using their lived experience, and there, there are some commonalities, such as knowing the limits of confidentiality and understanding HIPAA, um, having a code of ethics, and that, that type of thing. Um, adult peer support providers is consumer to consumer, um, and it's very much focused on um, recovery for that individual um, in their journey and in the adult serving system, um, housing, employment, um, that type of thing, um, as well as mental health. In the child serving system and with family or parent peer support, um, you have um, worked with the whole family. So while you're navigating all the systems that are very particular to children, um, you know, pediatrics, uh, uh, special education, um, juvenile justice, um, delinquency, that type of thing that uh, adult the adult world doesn't really deal with. They have to have knowledge in that, but they may also have to navigate some of the adult serving systems if there are parents that have those type of needs, um, such as employment, such as their own uh, mental health um, challenges that, that they need support for. Um, probably the biggest thing is that children are not little adults. Not little adults. Um, they always have to have an adult. Um, with them or some type of caregiver to access services, um, and they are developing constantly. So um, a parent peer support provider needs to be more flexible and trained in a number of different areas uh, to meet that need, whereas an adult um, has more static needs, I guess, um, along the same areas. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. But we are now at 3.57. I'm going to turn this over to Beth. I'm just going to remind folks, um, as I was about to type in the box in response to Stephanie, just please never, never feel as though you're cut off from us. Continue to send us emails with questions. We do have a rapid response mechanism. You will all be getting an email from me with the recording to this webinar, as well as the resources and uh, the link for next, week, next month's uh, learning community. Beth? You want to close yes, it thank you, Denise. And to wrap up, uh, I just want to ask you again to please hang in for just a couple more minutes so that you can use the link that will pop up at the end to complete a very brief evaluation survey. And I'd like to thank our presenters, Johanna and Millie, for their outstanding work on this learning community and the rich information they shared. I think they've left you with a lot of ideas and practical strategies that you can apply in your own states and communities. 